Hello, my name's Charles Willis-Owen. I'm a consultant orthopaedic surgeon with a specialist interest in knees and sports injuries, and I'm going to be talking about uh, knee examination. Firstly, a little bit about me. I went to medical school in Oxford and then did my higher surgical training in London. Um, I fairly quickly decided that I was really interested in sports from a personal and a medical perspective. So I then went out and worked in the Southern Hemisphere's largest sports surgery hospital in Australia for a year. And I also qualified in sports and exercise medicine as well as orthopaedic surgery and in sports psychology. Um, my current NHS practice is at both Bournemouth and Poole and my private practice is based out of the Harbour Hospital in Poole. I've always been very interested in sport and I've done lots of sport over the years and as a result I've picked up lots of sports injuries and knee injuries in particular and part of the basis of this talk is about that and how to examine a knee really slickly so that you can pick up any such injuries. We're all under increasing time pressures these days. In a typical NHS fracture clinic, we often have up to 80 patients, sometimes with only two doctors over three hours, which only gives us four or four and a half minutes per patient. I gather in general practice, it's 10 minute consultations, but by the time you've entered all of the data into the computer, etc., you're probably only left with six or seven minutes with the patient in front of you. Fortunately, in private practice, I have 20 or 30 minutes, so you can start to treat people a bit more like human beings, but nevertheless, we're under a lot of time pressure all of the time. Part of that consultation needs to be a physical examination if we're not to miss any important clinical signs and make a diagnosis. And therefore, it's absolutely vital that when you're examining somebody's knee, your examination is slick and efficient. This talk's not about how to pass the orthopaedic final examinations to be an orthopaedic surgeon. Um, it's a way of getting through a busy clinic, be it a fracture clinic or a general practice clinic, without feeling stressed, without feeling that you've missed anything from your uh, clinical examination, without needing to cut corners, and to still have some time for a cup of coffee halfway through the clinic. The role of the clinical examination is really, um, it has many different roles, but firstly to narrow down your differential diagnosis, which you may have come up with from your clinical history, but sometimes to broaden out your differential diagnosis if you pick up a clinical sign which suggests something that you hadn't picked up from the history. It can be useful to work out what sort of investigations are required or to direct an onward referral to see whether a patient needs to be sent to somebody else. It's also increasingly important these days to cover your back medico-legally, so we'll be talking a little bit about documentation of the clinical examination as well, so that you can keep out of trouble. Firstly, a little bit about history. There are a few key elements of a history for a knee injury which will quickly direct you to the right place and can be really beneficial. Firstly, a history of the problem itself. Has there been an acute injury or is it a chronic problem such as an overuse injury? Or falling between those two, is it uh, a chronic problem which arose with an acute injury some time ago that patients have been putting up with? There's a few cardinal signs, mechanical signs in particular, that suggest a mechanical solution, i.e. surgery might be needed. So if there's new clicking from the knee, if the knee is locking or giving way, these are all important signs and so-called red flags. A knee that swells up can be of importance as well, and that is often associated with degenerative joint disease, so arthritis within the knee if it swells with activity. Uh, we get interested with pain um, associated with activity but no pain at rest. That can imply some mechanical problems inside the knee or particularly pain at night time which is more suggestive of arthritis or degenerative conditions. And I'm always very interested in the activity profile of the patient in front of me. Particularly since I've moved down to Dorset, I've noticed that it's important not to judge people purely by their demographics, by their age. Um, and there are some uh, very elderly veteran athletes who have impressive um, recreational pastimes and performances. Um, so one must be careful not to stereotype based on people's demographic. But the activity profile can give you um, some important clues as to what's going on with the patient as well. There's a few classic histories which are not to be missed, things like an ACL rupture where there's been a twisting injury, usually without contact with another person, where the patient hears or feels or even another player on the, in the sports arena hears a, an audible pop or snap in the knee. If the knee then swells quickly and the knee gives way afterwards and the patient can't walk, that's usually a pretty reliable story for an ACL rupture. Similarly, meniscus injuries, acute meniscus injuries, have a fairly characteristic history of a twisting injury, feeling something go inside the knee, swelling afterwards and then persistent pain. I'll try and talk you through as I go, but we'll be going over it, uh, breaking it down and going over it a number of times, so don't get too worried. So we start by just 
looking at the knee, looking for any swelling, effusions, deformity, doing a patella tap test, which is seeing whether there's any fluid in the knee, seeing if the knee hyperextends, and feeling behind the back of the knee to see if there's fixed flexion. Flexing all the way up and seeing if there's pain, doing a quick McMurray's test in high flexion and then parking the knee at 90 degrees. We then feel down the quadriceps tendon, around the patella, and down the patella tendon. We then take a little moment to find the joint line and then feel around the medial joint line, looking at the patient's face and seeing whether they're in any discomfort, even asking them. And then the same feeling around the lateral joint line. With the knee at 90 degrees, we do an anterior draw test to see if the cruciate ligament's ruptured. And then we do a very similar Lachman's test at 20 degrees, pulling the shin bone forwards on the thigh bone. We check the collaterals and then we do tests for fat pad impingement, poking the thumb into the soft spot at the front of the knee and bringing it out straight. Finally and importantly, we check the hips at the end of any knee examination. Um, the next slide takes us through the individual um, stages of the examination in a little bit more detail. So in the first few seconds of any examination, as you're approaching the patient even, you can look at the state of the knee. You can see whether there's swelling in the knee, suggestive of a joint effusion, or swelling outside the knee with conditions such as prepatellar bursitis. You can see whether there's any redness, which may alert you to potential infections or bruising associated with recent trauma. There may be deformity in that the knee doesn't come straight, which we call fixed flexion deformity, or the knee may be bent towards the midline, varus deformity, or away from the midline, valgus deformity. You may notice muscle wasting, such as quadriceps wasting, which would suggest that an injury has been present for some time. The next thing I do in the examination, as we saw in the video, is to move. So, firstly, see whether the knee comes straight by pressing it down on the couch and then lifting the heel up off the couch. This will tell you firstly whether the knee can come fully straight and secondly whether there's any hyperextension. Hyperextension can be associated with all sorts of problems that we'll talk about later but that's an important finding. If the knee's not straight initially then I put my hand under the knee and ask the patient to push their knee down onto my hand to see whether they can bring it out straight and that's probably the easiest way to assess for whether there's fixed flexion deformity or not. Next we will then bend the knee all the way up as far as it will go. I'm not particularly interested in how far the knee bends. It can sometimes be useful to compare to the other side, but more interested in whether there's pain at full flexion. Conditions such as arthritis can lead to limitation in flexion and that can provide useful information, but there's actually a huge range for what a normal knee flexion angle is, ranging between 155 degrees in the most supple individuals to 130 degrees in people with stiffer knees and tighter muscles. As I say, it's more interesting as to whether there's pain at the end range of movement and sometimes to compare with the other side if the patient's worried about stiffness. During that movement uh, phase, just before I start, I tend to carry out a quick test to see whether there's an effusion called a patella tap. This involves putting the hand on the top of the knee, pressing any effusion that may be in the knee underneath the patella and then pressing the patella down to see whether you can make it bob up and down in the fluid underneath the kneecap joint. So if it doesn't make a tapping noise when you press on it, then there's no large effusion within the knee. The next step then is to park the knee at 90 degrees and have a feel down the knee. Before I do that, in high flexion, I twist the foot internally and externally. This is a version of McMurray's test, which is a test to see whether there's a torn medial or lateral meniscus. It's not a very reliable test, so the way I do it is somewhat half-hearted, but uh, I still do that because occasionally it can produce a click or pain which will tell you that there's a high likelihood that the patient has a meniscus tear. The sensitivity and specificity of the test is not great and sometimes you can cause quite a lot of discomfort if you do this aggressively which can lose the patient's confidence and that's the reason that I don't do this test with considerable enthusiasm. I park the knee then at 90 degrees and I feel down the quadriceps tendon then around either side of the patella and down the patella tendon. This is really looking for quadriceps tendonitis, patellofemoral joint pain or patella tendonitis. I then take a moment to make sure and be confident that I've located the joint line, starting on the medial side and feeling all the way around the medial joint line. Tenderness on the joint line itself is a reliable sign of a meniscus tear and this is probably the most useful sign. You can also get diffuse tenderness around the joint line in a more elderly knee with osteoarthritis and in this case you can often feel some palpable bone spurs or osteophytes around the joint line. Then I move on to special tests. As, an, as, as a specialist knee surgeon, I'm often interested in the state of the anterior cruciate ligament. And this is one thing that I spend a lot of my time repairing these days. With the knee in 90 degrees, I try to pull the shin bone forwards on the thigh bone. This is called anterior draw. And any movement increased from the other side 
or an abnormal amount of movement is suggestive of an anterior cruciate ligament tear. I then bring the knee out to 20 degrees and I repeat the test, which is called a Lachman's test. This is slightly more sensitive and can be a useful way of picking up an anterior cruciate ligament rupture as well. I prefer the Lachman's test over the anterior draw, to be honest. With the knee in 20 degrees, I then apply varus and valgus stress, assessing for laxity and any discomfort when stressing the collateral ligaments, both the medial collateral ligament and lateral collateral ligament. And these are common ligaments to be injured in a sports setting. With the knee still at 20 degrees, I then put my thumb into the soft space anteromedial and anterolaterally and bring the knee out into extension. This is a test for fat pad impingement or Hoffer syndrome. And if this test reproduces the patient's pain, then it's a reliable sign that there's some impingement or inflammation of the Hoffer's fat pad. This can be done both on the lateral side and the medial side. Finally, it's a very important part of any clinical examination of the knee to assess the hips. The hip can cause referred pain down to the knee and both arthritis in the hip or childhood hip problems can present as knee pain. And the courts will take a dim view of hip problems have been missed when a patient presents with knee pain. Missed slipped upper femoral epiphysis in children is one of the leading causes of clinical negligence claims in orthopaedics. There are a few additional tests which I will do on top of all of that if the history has been suggestive of specific problems. So there are tests for iliotibial band friction syndrome and I've got a small video to demonstrate testing for that. This basically involves placing the thumb over the lateral epicondyle of the knee and bringing the knee through the 20 degree arc of motion. So from fully straight, bent to 30 degrees, then back to straight. If as you do that movement, the patient experiences pain underneath your thumb at the region of the lateral epicondyle, then it's suggestive of iliotibial band friction syndrome. There is another test for ACL rupture called the pivot shift test. I wouldn't suggest that you do this in general practice, but it is a test that can be useful as a specialist knee surgeon. And the reason I mention it is you'll always see it documented in my clinic letters. It's basically a way of reproducing a patient's giving way episode, but it can be quite tricky to do. And if you don't do it gently, you can cause the patient distress and discomfort. It involves internally rotating the knee, applying a valgus stress and then flexing the knee up, which causes the knee to dislocate and then relocate, which unless you do it gently can be uncomfortable but that's really just so that if you see that in one of my letters, you'll understand what I'm talking about. Finally, if the history is suggestive of kneecap problems, then I look at patellofemoral tracking. I do this by sitting the patient on the side of the bed and asking, asking them to bend and straighten their knees slowly and look at the movement of the kneecap joint. You can also feel for patellofemoral crepitus by putting your hand over the kneecap joint as they move and see whether there's a grating sensation which patients can find uncomfortable. Finally, when you've done all that, you can relax safe in the knowledge that you've covered all of the main things that you should do in a knee examination. As I mentioned before, the next important thing is to document it carefully. In this day and age, if it's not written down in the clinical records, then from the court's perspective, it didn't happen. And your records may be invaluable to you in many years to come if anybody chooses to question your practice. Writing down knee examination normal is not regarded as enough in this day and age. So when I document a knee examination, I'll normally use a shorthand, but essentially write no effusion or deformity, full range of motion, or document what the range of motion was, state whether there was any extensor mechanism tenderness, state whether there was any joint line tenderness, state as to whether the ligaments were normal to stressing, and state whether there were any fat pad impingement signs. I'd also say whether the hips were normal or abnormal. I don't think you need to give a detailed description of the hips if the examination is principally for the knee, but you do need to mention that you assess the hips, and that can be absolutely pivotal. So you've now made some findings with your clinical examination, but we now need to interpret what those findings mean. So if you observe scars on the front of the knee, these can give you some useful clues as to what's been going on inside the knee. They, they either imply old injuries or old surgery. Look carefully for old arthroscopy scars, as these can be small and can fade away to being barely perceptible over the years. And often when you ask patients if they've had any surgery, for some reason they don't seem to count an arthroscopy as an operation. And they'll often tell you, no, I've never had any surgery. And you look at the knee and there's clearly some arthroscopic surgery scars. Um, if there's large surgical scars which are mature, it may suggest some childhood surgery, either for deformity or for trauma. And that can give you some clues as to any ongoing problems within the knee. If there's an old diagonal scar over the, either the medial or lateral compartment, that's a fairly reliable sign that the, claimant, the, the patient sorry, 
will have arthritis in that part of the knee. Those scars were used for open meniscectomy surgery, which is an operation that we don't do anymore for meniscus tear, and it involved taking the whole of the meniscus out. We now know that taking the whole of the meniscus out wasn't such a great idea and inevitably leads to arthritis about 20 years later. We stopped doing those operations about 20 years ago, so now anyone that has that diagonal scar is a fairly safe bet for having arthritis in that part of the knee. If there are old scars consistent with an ACL reconstruction, then we know that anyone who's had an ACL reconstruction has a higher chance of having a meniscus tear, so you may want to consider assessing the meniscus very carefully in patients with those scars. If we find a large effusion in the knee, it can sometimes mean that there's an inflammatory joint disorder or an inflammatory arthropathy. It may mean that there's some damage to the cartilage surface within the knee and areas of bare exposed bone will often cause an effusion in the knee. If there's been a recent history of trauma, then it implies that the knee may have a hemarthrosis or be full of blood. And if the knee's got a large amount of fluid in it but it's hot and red and swollen, it's suggestive of infection. If we notice deformity, then that can have important implications as well. A knee that doesn't come straight is what we describe as fixed flexion deformity. And a knee that doesn't come straight after an injury implies a locked knee or something mechanical jamming the knee. It needs to be treated promptly and ideally referred to an orthopaedic surgeon urgently. Ideally, we like to get to these within the first few days as there may be a torn cartilage which is jammed inside the knee that we could repair or there may be a loose piece of bone blocking the knee and it's best to remove this promptly. A knee that hyperextends or comes beyond straight can be associated with other problems. If it's happened straight after an injury, it can imply a, a rupture to a ligament. If it's a chronic problem and affecting both sides associated with pain at the front of the knee, then this can be to do with Hoffer's syndrome. And Hoffer's syndrome or fat pad impingement is much more likely in people who hyperextend. Looking at deformity in terms of varus and valgus, Varus means that the tibia is curved towards the midline. Valgus means that the tibia is curved away from the midline. Varus knees tend to make uh, good knees for sport and particularly sprinting sports, but there's an increased incidence of arthritis and an increased incidence of cartilage tears. Valgus knees tend to be more associated with problems with the kneecap joint. So this deformity can give you some clues. If the deformity is present from childhood and you're seeing these in young sports people, it tells you different things from whether the deformity is developed in old age where it's more likely to be associated with arthritis and gradual wearing away of the bony surfaces inside the knee. Range of motion, as I said before, is not all that important and the normal flexion angle is quite variable. I've said in this slide anywhere between 135 and 170 degrees. 170 degrees is more common in cultures which involve a lot of kneeling. It can be useful to compare with the other side, particularly if the patient reports that there's been a loss of range of motion as a result of an injury. But we're really interested in whether it's painful when the knee is bent right up, and this can imply either arthritis or a meniscus tear. Next, we're looking at tenderness. Feeling down the extensor mechanism, we're really feeling down the quadriceps tendon for quadriceps tendonitis. We're feeling around the patella to see whether there's patellofemoral arthritis or possibly chondromalacia patelli and we're feeling down the patella tendon to see whether there's any signs of patella tendonitis. We then take a little bit of time to locate the medial and lateral joint lines and feel around the joint lines. If there's a vague diffuse tenderness, then this can be, be associated with osteoarthritis. But if there's a very specific pinpoint tenderness, then this is most consistent with the torn meniscus. And if, there, if you think you've picked up a torn meniscus, you may like to go back and carry out that McMurray's test uh, with a little bit more enthusiasm to see whether you can provoke any discomfort or any clicking with that test. The McMurray's test itself is a test for a medial meniscus tear. There are many, many different descriptions of how to perform the test, which is usually an indicator that nobody knows quite the best way to do it and that the test isn't terribly reliable. It basically involves flexing the knee right up so that the posterior horns of the menisci are being squashed and then twisting the tibia internally and externally to try and aggravate some pain. You can do this by also applying varus and valgus stress to try and locate the tear to the medial or lateral compartment. But I've found it to be not terribly sensitive or specific, and it can be pa painful, so you need to start gently. Anterior drawer and Lachman's are both tests for an ACL rupture. Varus and valgus stress tests are for testing the collaterals, as discussed before. If any of these are abnormal, then an MRI scan is likely to be indicated, particularly if there's a history of an associated injury but it can be very useful to compare with the normal knee as there is a fair bit of variation between individuals as to what's normal for them.
Moving on to the test of fat pad impingement, and this is often a part of the talk that the audience finds more interesting because it seems to be something that's not well taught in UK medical schools. Fat pad impingement or Hoffer's syndrome is a condition whereby the large piece of sensitive fatty tissue behind the kneecap tendon becomes inflamed. This can either become inflamed because of a direct blow from a fall or a collision, or it can become inflamed through overuse. Once it becomes inflamed, it swells up and becomes larger, and then it's more likely to get irritated again, and a vicious cycle can start where there's pinching, swelling, pinching, swelling. Patients often report a dull ache at the front of the knee sitting still and pain going up and down stairs. They can get sharp pains when they're running or carrying out exercise, and the pains can be enough to make it feel as if the knee's giving way when the sharp pains come on. Sometimes the condition can be secondary to other problems such as wear and tear in the kneecap joint or patella tendonitis. So you can often find positive fat pad impingement signs coupled with other positive signs. The other way that fat pad impingement can come about is with what I describe as a clumsy arthroscopy where a surgeon has struggled to get instruments into the knee passing them through the fat pad and caused inflammation and scarring that way. And that can be the case even if the surgery was done several months ago. The way that we test for that is by placing the thumb in the soft spot at the front of the knee with the knee in 20 degrees and bringing the knee out straight, seeing whether this reproduces the patient's pain. If it does, then a very reliable way to further the diagnosis is to offer a small injection of steroid and cortisone into the inflamed fat and then repeat the test. If two or three minutes after an injection of local anaesthetic into the area, you repeat the test and the symptoms are abolished, you can be fairly confident that you've got the correct diagnosis. So, Assuming you've made some positive findings from your clinical examination and you've got a reasonable idea of what's going on, what do we do, do next? Well, what would I do in that situation? I'd do exactly the same as you presented to the patient with these problems. I'd take a detailed history. I'd carry out exactly the examination I've just described. And then I'd more than likely get some sort of diagnostic imaging to try and confirm my suspicions. These days, it's very rare that I'll discharge a patient from one of my clinics without some form of imaging. And that's because all of us are fallible and sometimes clinical signs and symptoms can be very difficult to interpret. And it's nice to add some objectivity with some imaging. This slide here just shows a lesson really of uh, the importance of getting some imaging. Down in the bottom right hand corner, there's an x-ray showing a knee with what is clearly quite a nasty osteosarcoma. This was a young man who came to the clinic right at the end of one of my clinics. A very stocky individual, well-muscled rugby player um, whose knee was quite difficult to assess. There'd been multiple small injuries, but nothing very dramatic, and he said that his knee didn't feel quite right. Clinical examination was difficult because he was so well built, and it was difficult to find any real positive clinical findings. There was some, perhaps some fullness around the distal femur, but not a lot more. It would have been very easy at the end of the clinic to dismiss this and tell him there wasn't much wrong, uh, but I fortunately made the decision to get some x-rays before doing so, and the x-rays revealed quite a nasty bone tumour Fortunately, because we'd picked it up quickly, we were able to refer him on promptly, but it does uh, demonstrate the importance of getting some objective tests. These days when assessing a knee, I tend to get a four-view series of x-rays, an AP weight-bearing view, a lateral view, a skyline view, and something called a Rosenberg view, which is really of merit for assessing the lateral compartment of the knee, with the, knee, with the x-ray taken in, with the knee in partial flexion bearing weight. I tend to look at the pictures myself and ignore the reports, but I appreciate that in general practice we're very reliant on the radiographer or radiologist's report. And x-rays I think are useful part, partly for confirming what you think you've found with clinical examination, but also they sometimes throw up some surprises which can catch you out and it just demonstrates the importance of getting them. Ultrasound can be a very useful form of imaging if you're assessing superficial structures such as tendons or ligaments on the outside of the knee. So for patella tendonitis or quadriceps tendonitis, ultrasound is often my preferred investigation, similarly to assess the MCL or lateral collateral ligaments. The images themselves are almost meaningless when taken in isolation and you have to rely 100% on the report. And for that reason, I'm careful who I get to do my ultrasound scans. Finally, most knee injuries these days will end up with an MRI scan sooner or later. We sometimes use special sequences depending on the suspected diagnosis. And for that reason, I quite like to see patients before the MRI scans have been done so that I can make sure that the right scan is done. Cheap scans can sometimes be misleading and the reports can also be misleading. So again, that's another reason that I quite like to have the patients referred to me without their scans. There has in the past been a tendency to scan everyone with a knee problem and then just to believe the report. 
And if we scan elderly degenerate knees, we'll see a whole shopping list of abnormalities and it can be quite difficult to interpret which of those abnormalities are really of any significance to the patient. And I've had cases where patients have got very distressed seeing all of these things wrong with their knee and it's taken some time to try and persuade them that a lot of those findings would be expected for knees in their condition and they're really not a big problem. So I tend to arrange specific MRI scans with a differential diagnosis in mind and I ignore the report and interpret the images myself and I interpret them with caution. So finally we'll come back to that video of the clinical examination once more and I'll just go through exactly what we talked about before just so that it's really concrete in your minds and hopefully you can remember to do that in your clinics. So starting with inspection, looking at the knee, looking for any deformity, effusion, redness, having a feel to see whether there's an effusion with a patella tap, looking for hyperextension or fixed flexion deformity, assessing the range of motion and seeing whether there's pain, a McMurray's test at full flexion, bringing the knee out to 90 degrees, feeling down the quads tendon, around the patella, down the patella tendon, taking a little bit of time to find the joint line and feeling around the medial joint line, looking at the patient's face, asking if it hurts, feeling around the lateral joint line, again looking at the patient's face, asking if it hurts. Doing that anterior draw for an anterior cruciate ligament rupture and then a very similar manoeuvre in 20 degrees, the Lachman's test. Feeling the collateral ligaments and then putting the thumb into the soft spot at the front of the knee and bringing it out straight, both laterally and medially, asking if there's pain. Finally, most important, checking the hips. Simple as that. Just a few abnormal findings now, because it's all very well examining an ordinary person with a knee that doesn't have any problems. So I just have a few little video clips of some abnormal findings. This is a cruciate deficient knee. So we can see a very positive Lachman's test with a lot of movement of the shin against the femur. And then an anterior drawer in the same circumstance. And we can see an abnormal amount of excursion. Finally, the pivot shift test, so rotating the knee in and it's quite hard to video, but there's a horrible clunk as we do that, and that's the knee going from a sublux position back into a reduced position. This was an interesting story. This was a, a chap who was on my operating list for an anterior cruciate ligament reconstruction booked by someone else, so the first time I'd seen him was the morning of the surgery. I asked him when the injury was and what had happened, and he told me there'd been no injury, which of course is almost incompatible with having an anterior cruciate ligament rupture. There'd been an MRI scan reported elsewhere uh, with no images and a report that suggested a torn anterior cruciate ligament. So I just paused for a moment and examined his knee carefully. And as you can see from the video, the video is consistent with the cruciate deficient knee. But I then took the time to compare this with his other knee. And his other knee had exactly the same signs of a cruciate deficient knee. It turned out, in fact, that he had hypermobility and his ligaments were intact but stretched out. I'm not quite sure why the report was wrong, but I've seen that many, many times. And actually, this man with his hypermobility was suffering from Hoffer's syndrome, and his episodes of giving way, which is what he was referred with, were due to pain inhibition from fat pad impingement. So he had an injection into his fat pad and walked away without an operation, feeling much better. Which just exemplifies the importance of carrying out a clinical examination. And certainly, as my role as the consultant, always examining patients prior to surgery, to ensure that their clinical signs tie in with what you're expecting. Here's some images of uh, hypermobile patelli, and you can see on the right the patella moves far too far across compared with on the left. This was consistent with the previous patellofemoral dislocation. Here are some photographs working around the clock face, the first one bursa, the second one gross abnormality with the patella lying laterally, a patellofemoral dislocation. Third one, really significant bruising associated with a medial collateral ligament rupture. Any bruise that looks like that is not going to be a minor knee sprain, and that needs a prompt referral and a scan. And fourthly, an empty trochlear fossa due to a patellofemoral dislocation, which is the sort of thing that you don't like to see. You don't like to leave these patelli dislocated for any significant length of time. That's the end of the talk. I hope that uh, after viewing this, you'll have a good appreciation of how to examine a knee in less than a minute picking up all of the important clinical signs and not missing anything significant. Thank you.